So as a follow-up to sharing the principles, you were invited to send in a bunch of questions, which were really excellent. Um, I've spent the uh, past couple of days trying to sort them out and to look at the different types of questions and thought that we'd approach them in, in two different ways. The first is to make a few global observations, and then the second part will be to answer specific questions for the four principles that you, you tackled. So in the global observations, there were more than 250 questions which were posed, which were really wonderful. And it really showed a great level of sophistication with the information about mind, brain, and education science. And, and it was really, really a pleasure to see the challenging uh, questions that came up. And I'd say of those uh, questions, about 20, 25% of them were focused on this, this thirst for more research. Um, there was a great recognition that you know, a single phrase or statement like, you know, all new learning passes through the filter of prior experience uh, or brain, brains are plastic or that attention and memory equals learning. Uh, those are nice phrases. It's kind of hard to argue with a lot of them, but most of you are saying, okay, but what's the real hardcore science behind it? I want to understand the biology of this. I want to understand those really neurophysiological processes that are occurring in the brain because it would help me understand my interventions in the class better if I understood the science better. So that was one type of question. Um, the second has to do with um, a worry that there might be contradictory statements. If we're saying that all brains are unique, um, how is it then that we can say that there are myths about brains, you know, generically stating that, which, which leads to this idea that maybe all brains are the same, so we can say that certain things would be mythical about them. So we want to address that as well. Um, then there was a large group, I'd say probably the largest group of questions had to do with this um, really wonderful desire to link, you know, the science to practical applications in the classroom. Okay, I buy this concept, but what does that mean for, for teaching in my real second grade class or in the language lab? Or what does this really mean for, for my practice? So looking at real practical applications. And the last had to do with... Um, specific domain area questions which were really really precise uh, and I'm not really sure that we can answer as many of those as we'd like to right now but I do invite you to write a specific email to me and tell me you know I was the one who asked that question about uh, the aging brain and, and schizophrenia or Alzheimer's or I'm the one who really wanted to know more about the impact of executive functions over the lifespan when you are, have a bilingual child versus a monolingual child. If you have very specific questions and I don't answer them in these videos, please do write me an email and I will give you full attention in sending you the, the resources, the information, documentation to back that up and to, to try to answer it as specifically as I can. So to respond to this first concern, right? I want more of the science behind this. Um, I was asked to make, you know, really short, short videos, like, you know, 10 minutes. And so I know that this isn't impossible to give the full explanation here. So what I did do is create links to two additional videos, which I think would be really helpful. One has to do with the basic neuroanatomy and the fundamentals of learning processes in the brain. Uh, I think this is about a 50 minute video and the basics of neuroplasticity. Uh, I think that's about a 49 minute video. Both of these go far deeper into these um, uh, global ideas about how is information processed in the brain? How do you actually learn? Um, if you recall, we gave a very short answer, you know, to this question, how does the brain really learn? And we said, we mentioned before, you know, that all new learning occurs through sensory perception or the memory of sensory perception. And once that signal enters the brain, you do a quick check with your amygdala and this to make sure that there's nothing to fear about the information that's coming in. Then you go to your frontal lobes, then you go back to your hippocampus for a double check. We talked about these in very global terms, um, but then what happens from there, uh, there? So how does that actually turn into an electrical or chemical synapse? How do those connections occur? How are they strengthened through repetition? We didn't go through enough detail about that. Um, so I'd like to invite those of you who are really interested in a bit more of the science behind this and a little bit more of the scientific terminology behind it to have a look at these videos. Additionally, for those who want to go even deeper into the science, Aaron Clark uh, co-taught the course uh, at Harvard, the Neuroscience of Learning, with me last semester. And she recorded um, a few videos on this uh, deeper dive into understanding uh, neuronal structures and neuroanatomy. So if you'd like to watch that, that's about 22 minutes or so, 23 minutes. And it gives a fascinating explanation and very 
comprehensible terms about the impact of the environment on cell structures. So for those of you really interested in, in more of the deeper science behind the information, um, please have a look at these videos. And if you would like further information, I would like to give you access to a mini library on functional neuroanatomy that we've developed over the years that has a lot of great um, literature, readings, uh, resources that explain in further depth the actual state-of-the-art understanding that we have about just how brains learn. As I mentioned, this gets really down to the molecular level. This is a really kind of a cellular-based, biology-based view of learning. So what I'd just like to caution you is to not lose sight of this more global transdisciplinary vision all the way from you know, society and culture that really have this impact down into your genes. This is why I really in particular enjoy Erin's work because as an epigenetist she really looks at this impact or this dynamics of what happens in the environment that potentiates genes. So uh, I hope you get a chance to look at her video. So we'll now turn to your specific questions about the different principles.